the British Isles. I've now visited these islands twice. After my first trip, because I didn't see nearly enough of it, I came back again a year later. Traveling again with a friend, I flew back into Dublin, but this time only for a short layover. We did have some time to kill though, so naturally we took a bus into town and had a few pints. After that, we were back on a plane for a short flight over to England. From London Gatwick Airport, we made our way to the Bluebell in High Wycombe, where we stayed for the night and had a hot meal next to a fireplace in their very cozy restaurant. I would always recommend going to the out-of-the-way lodgings and small pubs over the bigger, more commercial hotels. From there, we made our way into Oxford to meet some friends, where we attended liturgy with them at Holy Transfiguration Orthodox Church. The rest of the day was spent wandering around Oxford, sightseeing, and hitting some of the pubs I visited on my last trip, making me very happy. The next day, we headed to the town of St. Albans, specifically to St. Albans Cathedral, inside of which is the shrine of, you guessed it, St. Alban. St. Alban is the patron saint of my home church in Atlanta, so it was important for me to visit here. Some history. St. Alban is the first recorded Christian martyr in the British Isles. He was a native Briton who sheltered a Christian priest on the run from Roman persecution in the town of Verulamium. While the priest was in Alban's house, his piety and devotion impressed Alban, as did the content of his faith, and Alban became a Christian. Eventually, it became known to the local magistrate that Alban was sheltering the priest, but when the soldiers came to Alban's house, he put the priest's cloak on and presented himself as the one they were hunting, allowing the priest to escape. When he was brought before the pagan judge and asked why he had taken the place of the priest, he replied, I worship and adore the true and living God who created all things. I also am a Christian. After refusing to give up his new faith under torture, he was sentenced to be beheaded. The Roman town where this happened is today called St. Albans. The cathedral at St. Albans is a collage of various styles of architecture and design features progressively compiled over several centuries as parts of it were either destroyed and rebuilt or added onto later. Beginning at the west end of the nave, the longest nave in England, the large window lets colored light pour in, illuminating the ornate baptistry. On the nave columns, there are remnants of beautiful frescoes, comparatively rare in England, since most of that sort of iconography was destroyed during the 16th century Protestant Revolution. Going east past the unfortunate modern altar and large chancel screen is the choir and its wooden choir stalls. This is where the large bishop's throne, or cathedra, stands, making it a cathedral. This leads to the high altar and huge stone reredos, on which is featured saints including St. Alban, St. Benedict, and the Venerable Bede, among other important Western European and English saints. East of the high altar is the actual shrine of St. Alban. The shrine contained the bones of the martyr until 1539, when during the Protestant dissolution of the monasteries, most of them were lost or destroyed. In 2002, a church in Cologne, Germany, which had its own shrine for St. Alban, returned to the cathedral a shoulder bone of the most holy martyr. Overlooking the shrine are the statues of St. Stephen, the first martyr of the church, St. Alban, the first martyr of Britain, and Christ with his mother, to whom Alban draws our attention. In the easternmost part of the cathedral is the Lady Chapel, which for many years functioned as a school classroom, but has since been restored as an active chapel, dedicated in the honor of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Capping the entire cathedral is the large bell tower overlooking the city, atop which flies the flag of St. Alban. After lunch in town, we headed northeast to the region of Norfolk, reaching our Airbnb out in the absolute boonies sometime after dark. The next morning, we headed into the town of Walsingham, a quaint, somewhat out-of-the-way village now, but in medieval England, even in medieval Europe, one of the most famous and visited pilgrimage sites there was. Why is that? Some history. In 1061, five years before the Norman conquest of England, a Saxon noblewoman, possibly named Ricold but later recorded and Normanized as Richeldus de Faverche, had a series of three visions of the Virgin Mary, who showed her the holy house at Nazareth, the place of the Annunciation and where the Holy Family lived, and instructed her to build a replica of this house as a place of sanctuary, devotion, and hope. During the Crusades, when the Ottomans controlled Jerusalem and much of the Holy Land, when travel to that region would have been nearly impossible for pilgrims, this new shrine at Walsingham, England's Nazareth it was called, and the site of one of the earliest recorded Marian apparitions, became an immensely important pilgrimage destination, second only to Jerusalem itself and Rome. 
visited by thousands of pilgrims every year, including the majority of English monarchs, right up until Henry VIII, who actually himself visited twice. Of course, he later ordered the dissolution of all the monasteries, including the one at Walsingham, which had been established to look after the shrine, and both it and the Holy House were destroyed and plundered in 1538. Thankfully, the Anglican priest, Father Alfred Patton, vicar of Walsingham in the 1920s, built a new shrine to Our Lady of Walsingham just outside the old monastery walls, and now pilgrimages have returned to the site, with institutional presences there representing Anglicans, Roman Catholics, and Orthodox. Today, nearly 350,000 pilgrims and visitors come to Walsingham annually. The largest shrine site is the Anglican Shrine, built over an ancient well from which pilgrims are still able to drink. Inside this large building is also a small Eastern Orthodox chapel. Next to this shrine are the grounds of the old monastery, which were destroyed in the 16th century. All that remains now are some beleaguered ruins, the monastic crypt, and the grand arch from the old chancel. Nothing at all is left of the holy house built by Rakeldus, save a simple marker on the ground to mark the spot where it stood. One mile away from the site is the ancient Slipper Chapel, so named because pilgrims would confess their sins here, then remove their slippers or shoes and walk the last mile to the holy shrine barefoot. Inside the chapel is a statue of Our Lady of Walsingham, modeled after the original statue, which for centuries was in the holy house, but was taken off to London and publicly burned. Thankfully, its likeness was preserved on the old seal of Walsingham, so it wasn't forgotten. While exploring the area on foot, we met a nice lady named Jo, who opened her parish church for us, St. Peter's, built around 650 years ago. A wonderful example of a 14th century parish church, most of its features, including its wooden ceiling and baptismal, date from that time. The benches, dating from the 15th century, with their carved poppy heads, are one of the finest and most complete sets in Norfolk. The chancel and sanctuary were destroyed in the 16th century, so a new east wall and window were built against which the altar currently stands. We also dropped into an Orthodox church just down the road, Holy Transfiguration, one of three Orthodox sites in the immediate vicinity, proving just how universal the importance of this site of devotion truly is. Before leaving the region, since we were so close to the coast, we stopped at Wells Next to the Sea for a cup of coffee and a quick walk on the beach. From there, we headed south to the region of Kent, and specifically, we were on the trail to Canterbury. Canterbury is the most important city in the history of English Christianity. But why is this? Some history. In 597, a monk from Rome named Augustine came here to Canterbury to talk with the king of Kent, Ethelbert, about Christianity. The pagan king, who was already married to a Christian princess from across the Channel in Gaul, was impressed enough by Augustine's message that he was baptized a Christian. He granted permission for Augustine to preach throughout his kingdom, and it was from Canterbury that Christianity began to spread throughout all the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms in what would eventually become the unified country of England. Augustine was ordained Archbishop, and the Archbishopric of Canterbury has been the main seat of authority in English Christianity ever since. The first place I wanted to see in Canterbury was the original headquarters of Augustine's mission. This is the oldest continuous-use church in England. Originally built by Roman Christians in honor of St. Martin of Tours, probably in the late 4th century, it was abandoned when the Roman Empire left Great Britain and not used again for Christian services until Bertha, daughter of the King of Paris, was married to the pagan Ethelbert. One condition of her marriage was that she would be able to continue practicing her religion, so she brought with her a personal chaplain, was given the use of this old Roman church by the king, and when Augustine first arrived, this was his main church and base of operations. It's been repaired and added onto over the centuries, but its Saxon and even Roman portions are still part of the building to this day. I also, of course, visited the great Canterbury Cathedral, which was unfortunately undergoing major restoration work at the time. This impressive building is the result of several partial rebuilds over the centuries, but major portions of the east end, as well as many stained glass windows, date back all the way to the 12th century, the earliest example of Gothic architecture in the British Isles. The cathedral was in the care of a now-dissolved Benedictine monastery for many centuries, and the cloister and chapter house are still attached to it. 
The area near the south transept, known as the Martyrdom, is where Archbishop Thomas Becket was murdered by the agents of King Henry II in 1170, which is what this weird sculpture memorializes. Becket was targeted for defending the liberties of the church against the encroaching royal prerogatives of the king, and his murder shocked Europe. Within days, even hours, of being struck down during Vespers in his own cathedral, miracles were attributed to him, and continued to be for many years. He was quickly declared a martyr and a saint, and his burial shrine became widely visited among not just England, but even Europe. Nothing is now left of the shrine since it was destroyed by Henry VIII, but the single candle now marks the place where it once was in the East Chapel. Since my tour finished at the close of the day, I stayed for Sung Evensong in the choir, which is open to the public every night. After leaving Canterbury, we drove down to Dover to hike on the famous white cliffs overlooking the channel between England and France. The white cliffs of Dover formed during the Cretaceous period out of condensed remains of marine life, and because they erode so quickly, plant life is rarely able to form colonies on their sheer faces, leaving them generally a bare, stark white. While looking for some place to eat down in the town, we stumbled into this old ruin known as Old St. James Church, which was built in Saxon times and only finally destroyed by German shells fired from France during World War II. We left Dover sometime late afternoon and drove to the airport where we boarded a plane and flew back over into Dublin. We rented a car and drove up into Northern Ireland where we followed our GPS, or sat-nav as they call it, down a labyrinth of pitch black roads until finally finding our farmstead Airbnb well after dark. What we woke up to was a very tidy, charming guest house on a working horse farm settled in beautiful Ulster countryside. We were in this region because of the next stop on our itinerary, the town of Downpatrick. It was the shared burial site of three major Irish saints that we were there to see. St. Bridget, the holy nun of Kildare, St. Columba, or Columbkill, the holy monastic and evangelist to the Picts, and St. Patrick, the first great evangelist of Ireland, for whom this town was named. Some history. Patrick was originally buried at this site, and the two other saints, living in the centuries following, had been removed to this site from their original burial places to save them from the plundering of the Scandinavian marauders, St. Bridget from her monastery at Kildare, and St. Columba from his monastery at Iona. These three holy Irish saints now share this humble grave on the cathedral hill overlooking the town, marked only by this simple stone. Having visited and made our venerations at four very ancient and holy shrine sites across the British Isles, St. Albans, Walsingham, Canterbury, and Downpatrick, we concluded our trip with two relaxing days in the area of Newcastle, Northern Ireland, exploring the beaches and lakes and mountains, before finally making our way back to Dublin to fly home. My second trip to the UK and Ireland was just as great as the first, if not better, and definitely has not exhausted all that I still want to see and explore. The Lord willing, I will be back. <laughs>